Hello everybody, this is Tater Cowgirl, can survive <laughs> the wrap up um, of our um, adventures in Cheyenne. So the first thing you see on this video is us in Cheyenne, Wyoming and um, we had a good time there. We shopped at the Wrangler and a shop called Buckle. We had a big hailstorm when we were in the mall but nothing was damaged on the car. Um, we had a great lunch at the Albany restaurant right next to the Wrangler and they have a vegetarian uh, menu and they were so nice and said any item on the vegetarian menu they can tweak for me whole plant-based and vegan and uh, I got a barbecue tofu burger it was really good it was vegetables so Cheyenne two, two thumbs up for Cheyenne and very friendly also as I said in previous videos, uh, I'm really amazed about the friendliness of the people, the wait staff. Everybody is going above and beyond to make me happy. And uh, so this was Cheyenne. In the evening, we we weren't really that hungry when we came home to the hotel. So we just went next door to Wendy's. I got a baked potato and a salad, the usual emergency vegan food. <laughs> And it was enough, you know, I, I didn't really want to go out. And then um, we moved on to um, Custer, South the, no, we went on to Fort Laramie, which was great. And so I have a video on there. That's the next thing you see on the video. I start with photos from Cheyenne. I don't have a video from Cheyenne, only photos. And then uh, I made a, a video in Fort Laramie. No, did I make one? No, 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 no. We just had a pit stop, we looked at the fort, went to Fort Laramie Town, went to Fort Laramie Town, I'm in the swimming pool here in <laughs> my hotel, <laughs> to keep an eye on Eddie. And uh, we, we went to Vicky's Saloon in Fort Laramie Town, and again, this elderly lady does, of course didn't have a vegan menu on, on our list. And, when I told her what I can eat, she made baked the sweet potato fries, uh, zucchini, cauliflower, breaded cauliflower, breaded zucchini, and she didn't put it in the fryer. She baked it in the oven for me, and um, what else was in there? Zucchini, cauliflower, what else was in there? Sweet potatoes. There's some other vegetable in there. I put a picture on it, so you'll see it. On this video is a picture from it. Um, can't remember. Sweet potatoes, cauliflower, zucchini. Oh, mushrooms, mushrooms. Yeah. And that was really good. That was our lunch. And then we moved on to our uh, Super 8 hotel in Custer, South Dakota. Nice hotel, great pool. Uh, we have, uh, you see in the video, the hotel room. Uh, our bed has. Um, Mount Rushmore is a head board and Eddie called dips on her bed with Crazy Horse as head board. That's really cool. And uh, we found, we got rec recommended um, the Custer Corral Buffet. And this was really good. I think we go again tonight because um, I can't get everything I want. I got they charged me half price, uh, a little bit more than half price actually, but still, because they, they say I can eat meat, fish and uh, chicken, so they only charged me half price, like soup and salad bar. That was really nice. I mean, again, people are so nice here to a vegan. Nobody makes snarky comments or, you know, um, that's nice. And, uh, so we ate there and I, did I put a video on? Yeah, I did. I put a video on from that one. And this morning I had a McDougal oatmeal, you know, piece of toast with marmalade, that's enough for me. Some fruit, which I bought at the supermarket, some berries and a banana. And lunch we had, then we went to Mount Rushmore and the Crazy Horse Monument. Um, after that, we went to Deadwood for lunch. And I, uh, in Deadwood, I made a little movie from uh, 
the Wild Bill Salon where, where he got shot. Uh, and we found uh, vegan food at um, at um, um, God um, Mustang Sally's. I'm a little tired. You can see, right? Mustang Sally's. I got a veggie burger, black bean veggie burger. Really good. The, the fries I, I I didn't eat. They were, you know, fries. And I gave it to Eddie, who ate my fries. Uh, who uh, sacrificed herself eating my fries. They were great fries, but I just, you know, I don't want to eat it because they are fried in oil and I just, yeah, didn't need it. Wasn't that hungry. Um, we go to tonight. We now eat, I probably eat in the buffet again, because it's not far from the hotel. And we go tonight to the light show on Mount Rushmore that starts at 9, 9.30 in the evening. We are not far from there, so we say, let's let's go there again one more time. And I might make a movie if it's not too dark. Uh, sometimes it's too dark or too loud to, to really make a video. Like in the Albany restaurant, it, it, it didn't really work. But I have a picture on it and I put that on the video. The beginning is Cheyenne for Laramie. Uh, Custer and then uh, Deadwood and I might add a little bit from the Mount Rushmore light show tonight we will see how it works out and the next video will come from Cody Wyoming we are back in Wyoming and for the next video where we stay a night and then move on to Yellowstone and uh, then to Jackson Hole uh, Jackson Hole will be a separate movie, but the next movie will be Cody, Wyoming. All right, uh, have a good evening. Peace out. Cow. Tater Cowgirls can survive anywhere in the world. We arrived in Custer, South Dakota, in the Super 8 Wyndham Hotel. And look, our beds uh, have Mount Rushmore. <laughs> uh, we sleep in Mount Rushmore, and Eddie wanted to sleep in the Crazy Horse bed. We are Crazy Horse is right around the corner, so this is where we're gonna visit first, I guess. And it's cute. Nice little room. Let's see. This is outside. See Papa unloading the car right now. Okay, we got everything here from the TV and the sink out here. Actually, I can make some light here. And then you see something. We have a bathtub again, very important because we like to soak in the bathtub. And there's a nice pool in the hotel again, a jacuzzi, a breakfast, and a little souvenir shop, which probably will delight Eddie. We we did stop. Uh, we did stop at um, Fort Laramie, and uh, that was very interesting. It's a lot of history there. Uh, Native American history and uh, the Western, uh, you know, development, how the West uh, started to become what it is today. And it was very, very interesting. Um, we had uh, lunch uh, at a little, tiny little bar in uh, Fort Laramie town. And uh, the lady was very nice, uh, called Vicky's Bar. And of course, they had no no vegan or vegetarian on the on the list, but they had sides. Um, so she, what she did for me: over oven baked uh, sweet potatoes, uh, zucchinis, uh, breaded zucchinis, and um, what was the other? cauliflower, breaded cauliflower, and um, mushrooms. 
and she made me a plate with all these vegetables and it was very nice and say I, I, I want to make sure you're not going hungry and this now we have a vegan entry on our menu which I will put on and it, it tasted really good so we are happy and we are now in Custer uh, to explore the Crazy Horse Monument, Mount Rushmore, Deadwood. We, we do everything from here. And then we stay two nights and then we go on to Cody, Wyoming. So today will be my challenge to find food here <laughs> for dinner. And this, is, this will be the next part of this video. As they say in California, peace out, pow. This is uh, TV Cowgirls, Can Survive, and uh, we are today in Castor, South Dakota, and uh, we got recommended a buffet-style restaurant. It's the Custer Corral Buffet, family buffet, and uh, I got some really good food choices, vegan choices here, and I show you. See all these uh, vegetables I got, I mean, there's everything you want to get including a peanut sauce you can use and rice I have in there and, and pasta and then I have all kinds of fruit so you, you won't starve in pasta as a vegan <laughs> and um, we came from Laramie uh, stopped in Fort Laramie which was very interesting we also got uh, went into a bar in Fort Laramie tiny little bar in Fort Laramie town and the uh, elderly lady who owns it, uh, she made extra for me a vegan meal out of vegetables, baked. And um, I have to say the best so far experience on that trip is how friendly the people are, how, how they try to accommodate me. Nobody makes a stupid comment and everybody just goes up. Uh, Above and beyond to to uh, provide the food I I eat. All right, and uh, we will hear from each other a little bit more. We stay two days in Custer. I want to go to Deadwood also, so you will you get a little bit more information before we move on to Cody, Wyoming. As you say in California, peace out. Wow. Okay, we are in Wild Bill where Wild Bill Hickok got shot in the bar. They even have a flag for that. It's right here. Wild Bill Bar. It's called in Deadwood. South Dakota. So we're trying to get some food around here, but I wanted to show you the actually original bar. Let's put a let's peek in there, okay?
Okay, now we go and get some um, food. <laughs> Talk to you later in Deadwood, South Dakota. Hello again. So we had lunch at Mustang Sally's in Deadwood, South Dakota. I got a, a veggie burger. So tater cowgirls can survive in South Dakota. And uh, next time I talk to you, we will be in Cody, Wyoming. Peace out. Pow. Stop it! Hang on! What is he doing? What is he doing? It's like he's saluting the flag. Oh. On January 25th, 1961, John F. Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States. He proceeded to give one of the most famous presidential speeches in our country's history. He concluded that speech by saying, quote, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country, unquote. But that's not the entire story. The day before a Nor'easter slammed into the East Coast of the United States, and dropped eight inches of snow on Washington, D.C. Totally unaware of what President Kennedy would say later that day, 1,700 Boy Scouts stepped up and assisted the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and 1,500 employees of the District of Columbia clear our nation's capital street. Those Boy Scouts, soldiers, and employees embodied what President Kennedy was trying to tell all of us. But they're not the only ones to stand up when our country called. All you have to do is look around you. I'm referring to the faces of the members and veterans of our armed forces, and that's why later in the program, I'm going to invite them downstage so we can thank and honor them. But also, you have no further to look than the faces on the mountain. In 1775, 400 farmers, craftsmen, and merchants fired a shot heard around the world when they challenged the most respected army in the world, the British Army. After being reinforced by more Minutemen, that ragtag, disorganized army besieged the British in Boston. Our Continental Congress asked George Washington, stand up, take command of that army. George Washington wrote his wife, Martha, he did not feel up to the task and had not sought the position, but felt, quote, it was utterly out of my power to refuse, unquote. Despite the disastrous defeats of Long Island and Brandywine, through the miserable winters of Valley Forge and Morristown. By sheer force of will, George Washington kept that army together. He led that army for eight years until the British realized, this is a fight we cannot win. The war was over. Many went to George Washington and said, this young country's not ready for independence. It's not ready for democracy. You should crown yourself king. George Washington refused, resigned his military commission, and went home to his beloved Mount Vernon. But our country was not through with George Washington. We needed him to preside over the convention that wrote our Constitution. And then he returned to his beloved Mount Vernon. And yet again, his country called, called upon him to be our first president. And then he returned to his beloved Mount Vernon. Henry Whitehorse Lee may have described George Washington best when he wrote, quote, first in war, 
first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen, unquote. In 1803, Thomas Jefferson sent James Monroe to France, wanted him to buy land west of the Mississippi River, or at least New Orleans. But instead, the French offered us the entire Louisiana Purchase. That's 800,000 square miles, reaching from New Orleans all the way to the Rockies and beyond. All of that for only $15 million. But Thomas Jefferson questioned its constitutionality. Thomas Jefferson had always been a very strict interpreter of the Constitution. Article 4 of the Constitution does allow for the addition of new states, but says nothing about acquiring land from foreign countries. In order for the Louisiana Purchase to be completed, Thomas Jefferson had to compromise one of his most sacredly held beliefs. Later, he called the Louisiana Purchase a, quote, great achievement, unquote. Thomas Jefferson doubled the size of our country, showed us how to acquire new lands without resorting to violence, conflict, or war. In 1810, Jefferson wrote, quote, it is incumbent upon those to accept great charges to risk themselves on great occasions, unquote. Less than 60 years later, our country would face its biggest challenge. Only 44 days after Abraham Lincoln was elected president, South Carolina withdrew from the Union. Just two days later, Abraham Lincoln wrote, quote, I fully appreciate the present peril the country is in and the weight of responsibility on me." Unquote. Through four years of Americans killing Americans, Lincoln stood firm. Through the defeats of Bull Run, Wilson's Creek, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Chickamauga, Lincoln stood firm. Despite the bloody stalemates of Stones River, Shiloh, Wilderness, Lincoln stood firm. Despite the costly victories of Antietam, Gettysburg, Lincoln stood firm. In the darkest hours of that conflict, Abraham Lincoln had the moral courage to begin the process of freeing our nation's slaves. And as the war was beginning to wind down, and it was obvious was the North was going to win, Lincoln didn't step back from his responsibility of reuniting this country. In 1864, he said, quote, with malice towards none, with charity for all, with the firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds." Unquote. The years after the American Civil War, the Industrial Revolution changed our country. By the year 1900, we were the leading industrial power in the world. The Industrial Revolution totally redistributed the wealth of our country, completely changed the ethnic composition of our population. It even changed the landscape itself. This new country was dominated by robber barons and their trusts. Our political system was controlled by political bosses and their political machines. The working class, the underprivileged, the poor had little to no power in this new society and culture. But the working class was getting organized, unions. Reform movements were gathering speed. The unions and reform movements were on a collision course with the robber barons and bosses. Strikes, demonstrations, riots, violence broke out across our country. Many, including Theodore Roosevelt, felt our country was headed towards a new kind of civil war. And Theodore Roosevelt felt 
felt that it was his moral obligation to help this country avoid such a war. In 1903, Roosevelt wrote, quote, all I want is a square deal for every man, unquote. When Roosevelt was governor of New York, he abolished child labor, limited hours for women workers, reformed the state civil service system, increased teacher salaries, created new state parks and new state forests. As president of the United States, he challenged those robber barons and actually broke many of their trusts. He challenged and lobbied Congress to reform our labor laws. His foreign policy included the Panama Canal and ending the Russo-Japanese War. His domestic policies doubled the size of the national park system and added millions of acres to our national forests. He even created our first federal wildlife preserve. Theodore Roosevelt's changes to the presidency was so great, many historians today call him our first modern president. In 1913, Roosevelt wrote, quote, I acted for the public, for the common well-being of all our people, whenever and in whatever manner was necessary unless prevented by the Constitution, unquote. Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Roosevelt. When their country needed them most, they were there. So in conclusion, as President Kennedy said, quote, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do, unquote. States of America. <clears throat> it's hard to imagine, but not long ago, this great land of ours was pure wilderness. A place where millions of bison roamed freely throughout the plains. And those who lived off the land revered it as sacred ground. Yet this country would face a dramatic change, quickly becoming the most advanced nation in the world, in technology, in peace, and in power. From its inception, the United States has shaped itself under the guidance of strong leaders. Leaders who have taken risks, stood up to adversity, and never let go of their vision for a better country. Mount Rushmore reminds us that, and the countless Americans who have made great sacrifices to ensure the lasting legacy of our country. Free. We strived for it. We died for it. We live for it. was 1923. The place, the Black Hills of South Dakota. 
State historian Don Robinson proposed that these granite outcroppings could be the site of an enormous monument dedicated to the heroes of the West, such as Lewis and Clark and Chief Red Cloud. But commissioned sculptor Gutson Borglum had a different concept in mind. Borglum was a passionately patriotic man and believed that a more fitting tribute should honor the American experience. A memorial that would represent our ideals, our dreams, and our accomplishments as a country. A memorial that would convey a spirit of patriotism. Borglum chose his canvas carefully, the giant granite rock face of Mount Rushmore. And in 1927, work on the mountain began. Borglum assembled a team of local miners, ranchers, and lumbermen to help with construction. The sculptor built a model of the residence to serve as a guide. Every inch of the model represented one foot on the mountain. After year, Borglum and his crew hung perilously on the side of the mountain, drilling and blasting their way to reach granite solid enough for carving. It took 14 years and nearly $1 million to complete the four 60-foot faces. And even though the sculptor did not live to see the very final touches put into place, he was able to carry out his vision. Four great Americans immortalized in stone. Symbolizing the democratic society in which we live, the struggle for our independence, the fight for our freedom, and the sacrifices we have made since our country began more than 200 years ago. time of rebellion and of war. It began as an uprising against British rule and turned into a full-fledged crusade for personal freedom and national independence. The American Revolution. From 1775 to 1783, up to 250,000 patriots engaged in battle. Even during the toughest times, when the Continental Army seemed undisciplined and ill-equipped, one man's courage and determination ultimately led the troops to victory over the British. The future father of our country, George Washington. Born and raised in colonial Virginia, George Washington grew up to be a firm believer in American independence. Even though his heart yearned for quiet family life at his Mount Vernon home, his deep commitment to the Republic made him answer the call of his country time and time again. As general, Washington became an instant hero throughout the colonies. The public was so enamored with him that many people wished that he become king. But Washington scoffed at such an idea. The army must serve the country, but not rule it. Express your utmost horror and detestation of the man who wishes to overturn the liberties of our country. George Washington, 1783. It was this kind of insight and integrity that made him the perfect person to oversee the creation of a new federal government. With no blueprint to follow, Washington kept the colonies united and on course during the infant years of this nation. And after ratification of the Constitution, when he was unanimously elected first president of the United States, Washington was keenly aware that he was laying down the framework for future presidents to follow. 
Washington's legacy is that of a man who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. In his inaugural address, he spoke of the task that lay before this new nation. The preservation of the sacred fire of liberty and the destiny of the Republican model of government are justly considered as deeply, perhaps as finally as stake, on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. George Washington, 1789. George Washington welded this union, but it would take another great visionary to expand it. Thomas Jefferson, third president of the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thomas Jefferson, 1776. Thomas Jefferson was the voice of the American people inspiring patriots with his carefully crafted words written in the Declaration of Independence, the document that gave birth to our nation. It was also Jefferson who fought for religious freedom and the democratic notion that people should have a say in government, two very American principles we cherish today. Thomas Jefferson always thought of himself more as a scientist or scholar than as a politician. And it was this quest for knowledge that played a role in the greatest achievement of his presidency. 1803, Jefferson acquired the French lands west of the Mississippi in the Louisiana Purchase, which doubled the size of the country. In an effort to find out what America now owned, Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark on their famous expedition out west. It was an exciting time of discovery for new Americans. However, what was good for a growing nation was not necessarily good for its original inhabitants. During this time of expansion, many Native Americans were uprooted from their homes and hunting grounds and pushed farther west. But during an address to a group of Cherokee chiefs, Jefferson prophesied about future relations between natives and new settlers. I shall rejoice to see the day when the red men, our neighbors, become truly one people with us, enjoying all the rights and privileges we do, and living in peace and plenty as we do, without anyone to make them afraid, to injure their persons, or to take their property, without being punished for it according to fixed laws. Thomas Jefferson, 1808. Jefferson's dream was slow to be realized as conflicts between the U.S. government and Native Americans set off a chain of events that dramatically reduced Native populations throughout the 19th century. Thomas Jefferson believed in the promise of America and had faith in the American people. But this faith would truly be tested nearly 60 years later, when the Republic came dangerously close to a <laughs> The Civil War was the most tumultuous period in American history. The differences between the states had deeply divided a nation, pitting brother against brother on American soil. But it was the determination of one man to keep the United States united. Abraham Lincoln, our 16th president. Abraham Lincoln was a self-made man of great character, a frontiersman who came from humble beginnings. When Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861, he faced more adversity than any other president in U.S. history. Many southern states had withdrawn from the Union. 
And even though Lincoln opposed war, he warned the South in his inaugural address that he would take whatever measures necessary to stop the rebellion. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. Abraham Lincoln, 1861. The Civil War raged on for four brutal years. But Lincoln stuck to his commitment to democracy. His main objective was to save the Union, and he also strongly believed in freedom for all Americans. Until slavery was abolished, Lincoln felt the U.S. could never truly be the home of the free. Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation began the process that ended the evils of slavery forever. Over half a million Union and Confederate soldiers lost their lives in the Civil War. But during his famous Gettysburg Address, Lincoln reminded the American people what this war was really all about. That we here highly resolve that these dead should not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that this government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Abraham Lincoln, 1863. Over the next 50 years, the United States would go through a dramatic transformation. The year 1900 was coming around the bend, and America was turning from a rural republic to a budding industrial republic. It was clear that this new century, which burst before, needed a fresh start and a fresh approach. It was Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president, who led the way. Is America a weakling to shrink from the work of the great world powers? No! The young giant of the West stands on a continent and clasps the crest of an ocean in either hand. Our nation, glorious in youth and strength, looks into the future with eager eyes and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Theodore Roosevelt, 1897. He was energetic, he was robust, and he was eager to show the world that America was a force to be reckoned with. Theodore Roosevelt believed in the strenuous life. Frail and sickly as a young boy, he overcame his illnesses and grew up to be a naturalist, a cowboy, a war hero, an author, and president of the United States by the young age of 42. His vigorous outlook on life transferred to the Oval Office. Roosevelt was a man of action. He promoted economic freedom and was a friend to the working class protecting their rights against big business and what he called the criminal rich. Roosevelt also expanded the country's power abroad. It was his support of the 1903 revolution in Panama that led the U.S. to acquire territory for the construction of the Panama Canal. This massive undertaking not only created a valuable link between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, but it put the United States on the map in world politics. Yet, Roosevelt may be known best for his passion for the outdoors. He was vocal about conservation, and through the power of his presidency, he provided federal protection for almost 230 million acres of land. To waste, to destroy our natural resources, to skin and exhaust the land instead of using it so as to increase its usefulness 
will result in undermining in the days of our children the very prosperity which we ought by right to hand down to them amplified and developed. Theodore Roosevelt, 1907. The pursuit of the American dream did not end with Theodore Roosevelt's term. Instead, it has carried us into the 21st century. Throughout history, countless Americans have made great sacrifices so that we can enjoy the freedoms of this land. The same freedoms guaranteed in our Constitution and Bill of Rights. The same freedoms millions of people have sought since the first immigrants arrived over 200 years ago. Gutson Borglum reminds us of this with his timeless memorial. Four Americans representing the birth, growth, preservation, and development of this country. All embodying the spirit of our nation. All advocates of freedom, dignity, and the ideals of American life.
this time I invite all military personnel, past and present, to the stage. If you are unable to come, please appoint one person to represent you. I also invite those who have lost a loved one in military service to consider sending forward one representative. Ladies and gentlemen, for, those, for most of these men and women, they have never met each other, and yet tonight, they are bound together on stage. For most, this is the only public recognition 
they will ever receive for their willingness to serve. As they rejoin their families, let's show them one last time how proud we are of them with another loud round of applause. time for you to take over. I give you two challenges this evening, so Junior Rangers, it's now up to you. Ladies and gentlemen, please drive safely tonight. There are a lot of four-legged creatures out there, and I'm proud to say I have not lost a veteran yet, or a veteran or public visitor yet. So please drive carefully and avoid all those four-legged creatures. Obey the speed limits. Look around you. Gather up your belongings. Drive safely. Thank you for attending tonight's program.